This is the Life with Grief podcast, the podcast that talks about and normalizes the complexities of grief, life after loss, and all this entails, and so much more. I want you to think of this podcast as a safe space where I'm a friendly face and we're just journeying through this together to figure out how to live life with our grief in tow. I'm your host, Tara Accardo. I'm a grief and transformational life coach, and I'm here to serve you guidance, support, tangible coping tools, inspiration, and some laughs along the way to help you cultivate a more meaningful, intentional, and beautiful life. But grieving or not, we're getting into countless topics here on the podcast, from coping with loss to self-development and so much more. I'm so grateful you're here. Let's dive right in. Hi guys, welcome back to the Life with Grief podcast. I'm your host, Tara Accardo. And today I am really, really excited to get into this particular topic. And it is definitely one that has come up on the podcast before in some of my conversations, but I thought it was really important that we dig into this one a little bit more. I feel like there's even so much more to get into on this particular subject than I can even get into in just one episode here. So potentially more to come, but for today, I wanted to talk about coping with unmet expectations. And I feel like there can be grief around having certain expectations on things, both in and out of our grieving experience. And what I mean by that is there are kind of two ways that we can grieve expectations or standards from those around us that they're perhaps not meeting, right? So the first being, for example, maybe you have an expectation of a parent or a friend or someone close to you maybe nothing particularly high, just things that you would expect a parent or a friend to follow through on and they let you down. Another way to look at this is more specifically during the grieving process, you might expect people to perhaps be there for you in a particular way and maybe they let you down. So today I wanted to address this sort of across the board and just talk about some tools and mindset shifts that we can use to be realistic with our expectations and how to process unmet expectations to process your loss specifically in a healthy way. If you are dealing with this in your grieving experience, because this is something I definitely went through. (laughs) I know it well. And my hope with this episode is that it It's just a starting point to provide you some guidance and different ways to think about this so you can process these unmet expectations without experiencing maybe so much disappointment or hurt from those around you. From everything I've gathered from my own personal experiences with fairly or unfairly expecting something from someone or a group of people, I felt like splitting this ideology into categories is a good place to start. So here's what I mean by that. If you think of a funnel, this is sort of what I like to call my my unofficial expectations funnel, right? (laughs) So if we're envisioning this funnel, I think most people would agree there are expectations you would expect or require even on just a human to human level. For example, we would expect and hope that most people would not commit some horrific crime, right? Or even non-horrific, just a crime in general. Now, of course, this does happen, but the general expectation is like, you don't do that, right? So that's high level. This would then be followed by societal expectations, like those of the country or the state that you live in. And that's important because, again, of course, if you travel, you know that expectations can vary from country to country or even state by state, for example. Then we have our community expectations, like those within your city. This could also be kind of just societally or perhaps even a smaller community that you interact with, maybe like a church group or something like that. Then we get more into the the nitty gritty. So these could be like familial expectations, a standard you might have of close family or friends who know you better than someone in your community might, right? So this leads us to then one-on-one relationships within the funnel. This is kind of like at the bottom. And these are personally the ones that I think can often be at the core of what can hurt us the most when it comes to unaligned expectations. It might be easier to accept that someone from another culture or from a completely different country behaves differently than you on a societal or community level, 
right? Like kind of what I just alluded to. Though one could argue that there are certainly some human to human norms that could cross over. So that's what I was talking about sort of at the beginning of the funnel. But when we talk about having varying levels of expectations between family or friends, that's where things can get really sticky and that's where things can get deep. And that's really the focus of today's conversation and especially how this pertains to the grieving experience in particular. It's these one-on-one relationships that are really, really critical relationships where because there are family members or friends that ultimately know you better than some old Joe Schmo down the street, right? (laughs) You rightfully expect a little bit more from them. You might expect them to respect you, to love you, to be there for you physically and emotionally and treat you as they would want to be treated. However, expectations have the potential to get muddied by so many things. Nature versus nurture, poorly communicating wants and needs, the list goes on and we are only starting to scratch the surface here. But to come back to this nature versus nurture thing here really quick, I want to touch on this because I think this is a super important point. In my experience, I definitely am of the belief that there is a part of us that comes into this world and will, simply based on our nature as a human, have a set expectation level as we grow up. But I think a far bigger part, the nurturing part, can play a really significant role. So what I mean here is if you think about these following questions, right? Like, how were you raised? Who were you raised by? What expectations did they have or did not have and why? And by that, we could even go even deeper, right? Who were they raised by? Were you raised in a household that was very strict where really good grades and that doctorate degree or whatever it is, was the gold standard? Or were you maybe part of an upbringing that was a little bit more lax where there was sort of a do the best you can mentality? (laughs) Or was it a home where there was maybe no expectations or maybe sadly the child was really more of the parent and perhaps the parent was not around or they were checked out or whatever. So I really like to kick off this conversation by just like putting that out there. Consider also work experience, other peer groups that you or they might associate with, schooling or education, and the impact that maybe even an educator could have on you. So I just want you to understand like there could be so many nuances here that could play a role in developing our expectations of people. So consider all possibilities here. Now your homework should you choose to accept it, is to take a step back for a moment and think about this. In every relationship where you might be struggling with managing expectations, whether you are currently going through this, whether you have been through this before, or whether this is something that you might go through in the future. The biggest lesson that I have personally had to learn is this. You cannot expect you from someone else. You cannot expect yourself from someone else. This is incredibly important. Let that sink in (laughs) and really work on understanding that you guys, I made this mistake so many times and I still do without realizing it sometimes. Although I've definitely gotten a lot better about identifying (laughs) when this might be happening. Truly this statement is so accurate, whether you've lost someone or not. Having expectations of people is totally fair and, and needed, right? And I encourage you to keep people around you who are aligned with yours. If it is a relationship that is no longer serving you, it is someone that maybe doesn't make you feel your best or is someone you can no longer trust. It might be time to reevaluate that relationship or lovingly release that person from your life. I have had to do that more so with acquaintances, but there was one friend in particular that I had known a very long time. I I still do. I don't consider this person like not a friend, but they had, I'll be very honest. They disappointed me in such a big way at a very important time of my life as I was about to get married. And they were supposed to be more a part of that process. And they really checked out. They were not communicating. 
very basic expectations were not being met. And it really made me have to come out of the situation a little bit and really think about like, okay, is this like beyond this situation? Because this person had done this to me in the past. And I eventually, you know, this was after my parents died and I had to just reevaluate and I had to get to the point where I was like, I, I don't deserve this. I deserve to have friends or people in my corner that, that care, that care enough to communicate, to care enough to check in, to care enough to, to share what's going on. And it just felt very one-sided. So this is a great segue into my next point, And that is knowing your worth know what you mean to someone. And if they are not bringing that quality into your life, it might be time to have a tough conversation or at least reevaluate that relationship. And the example that I just gave, you might have to rip that bandaid off because the last thing that you'll want to do in this lifetime is be left wondering or wanting more out of people. That is where a lot of ruminating thoughts can live. That's where we can get into a very dark place but so much of that power is within us. And I'm really excited in a little bit, we're going to talk about this idea of this let them theory. And you may or may not have heard about this, but stay with me because I'm really, really excited to talk about that. But that is just a perfect example of a way that, you know, if, if we're constantly wanting more out of people or we're wondering like why they are or are or aren't giving us something that we're craving, it's, it might be time to take the power back on that a little bit. So more to come on this topic, but you know, if we live there and we're choosing to live there, that can be just a very sad and a very dark place to be on top of what you're already dealing with. If you're going through a loss, which if you have stumbled on this podcast, you probably are (laughs) in some capacity. So, you know, for me, this happens so many times and in so many different ways when one or both of my parents died. Now, did I always have that tough conversation about my disappointment every single time, like I just mentioned? Absolutely not. I will admit that. Sometimes relationships or people phase in and out of your life naturally, and really only you can determine whether it's meaningful for you to have that conversation or not. I always want to preface this though, you guys. I am not a therapist, right? If you are truly struggling with someone in your life, perhaps a very important person in your life whom you have a very important relationship with, please seek professional help on this. Okay. This is again, this is just me as a grief coach's perspective (laughs) coming at you with this, but you know, there could be mixed feelings and, and guidance on this of whether having a conversation is necessary or not. Right. So please just remember Context is important here. (laughs) Very important to think about who this person is in your life and what role they play. As an example of unmet expectations, some close family members barely said a word to me or really offered any real condolences after my parents died or like really thinking, especially after my mom died. And I'm, I'm talking close people within my immediate family, like aunt and uncle kind of relationship. Or it was like posted on Facebook before they even really like checked in on me to make sure I was okay. Um, Or just to even have any kind of conversation between us. Not that it was like my mom's death was all about me, but you know, I was here on the front lines. Like, and I really didn't even get like a, how are you holding up? Like, I can't imagine watching my mom die in front of me. You know what I mean? Like it was just, it was shocking. And this happened a shocking amount of times from people that I had expected more from. I had expected a different level of maturity, a different level of grace, of self-awareness from adults that were more grown than I was at the time and still are more grown than me. And I want to say, like, I don't feel that that is an unfair thing to do, right? When we're especially from those that are older than us, we would kind of think like they have this wisdom or just they're a little more wise and a little more like on top of things like this. But a surprising amount of time, they're not. At the end of the day, like they are just humans on this planet too, right? And not everyone is is so on top of it at times. Not everyone has that awareness. So unfortunately, even if you do, that doesn't mean the people around us are going to. Another point I just want to bring up is 
on the flip side, because I don't want this to be all doom and gloom, <laughs> there is a part of us that can and should appreciate who or what is in front of you. And this was a, another really important lesson that I had to learn. Listen very closely to this. Put your energy with the people who are showing up for you. Thank them, love on them, appreciate them, and show them some love and show up for them in the way that they are showing up for you. However that looks, because you never know when someone's going to need that one day. When you can tap into this, I promise you it truly will turn your mindset around. And again, this is not like a toxic positivity thing here. Okay. This is not to negate any other relationships in your life that are important that might need that help right now. It's just, it's a balance, right? We, it is so important in my experience to focus, not just focusing on the positive and like trying to make it through the day, just focusing on the positive, right? That's not what I'm saying here. It's just to honor those, to thank those genuinely who are showing up and coming through for you. That's all. That's all I mean there. And it's surrounding yourself with this kind of love and energy that is uplifting and, and matches yours. Or maybe it's just this loving energy that maybe you don't have right now because you're going through something difficult. But I promise you, surrounding yourself by more of this is very uplifting and it's very empowering. And despite the more, let's say, lackluster people in your life that you perhaps expected more from, here you have people that are making the effort. Maybe some people you didn't even expect, or maybe some people that just came out of the woodwork when they heard about your loss. That happened to me as well. And that was amazing. And that honestly did help make up for some of the people that were not showing up for me. And maybe they do this because they've been through a similar situation too, and they want to connect with you. Embrace that when you're ready, right? You don't have to push yourself. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do, but just having appreciation for that. And these beautiful souls that are coming in to try and help you. That has happened to me. And I've also been blessed to be able to be that person for others. And also through this podcast and through losses become gains. I'm hopefully that person for you as well. But it really is truly so empowering to both receive that and then give it back in abundance. Embrace those beautiful and meaningful connections. Nurture them. That is all I can encourage <laughs> today. And if it feels appropriate to step away, whether temporarily or permanently, from those who aren't keeping you at your highest frequency, those who aren't keeping your spirits up, and keeping your happiness or whatever semblance of happiness you have right now <laughs> alive, then that is an action you may want to consider. And guess what? That is perfectly okay. And that's perfectly healthy to do as well. So let's shift into just the reality of expectations for a moment. Let's be real here. Not everyone around you will know what to do or say or how to treat you after what you've been through. That is the reality of the situation. That is the reality of grief. Grief can be very uncomfortable. It makes people kind of squeamish. They don't know what to say or do or how to support you. And this is really the purpose of this podcast. I want there to be more <laughs> grief literate people out there. But until then, that is an understanding that we have to have. A perfect example of this in my world is my husband, John. And what this looked like at the beginning of my grieving experience. And honestly, you guys, I learned a great deal from it. And so much so that I actually had him on the podcast a while back to talk about exactly this and how it affected our relationship. If you have not gone and listened to that episode yet, please do. It's number one. It was just so fun to have him on the podcast. And it is still like by far one of my most listened to episodes it's really fun. It's it's a very eye-opening conversation. <laughs> okay, so it, that is episode nine. If you want to check it out, I'll link it in the show notes. But nowadays, I must say, John is exponentially better <laughs> at handling someone, that someone being me, who is processing grief. And I am far better at having more realistic expectations of myself and others around me than when my losses first happened, which makes sense, right? Especially if you've never been through something like that before you're in survival mode. You're just, you're just trying to figure things out. You are just trying to get through moment by moment. 
Hey, my friend, are you needing some relief from your grief? If so, I have an exciting new offering that will help you get exactly that. My 14 day relief in your grief challenge brings you powerful, impactful, bite sized daily content alongside the perfect meditation. One of the biggest struggles I hear from my members, clients, and people on social media is that they just need some relief from the stress, sadness, and pain that grief and loss can cause. But here's the thing. So many people are lost and unsure about where to start. This can feel like a huge thing to tackle. So we are doing it together and we're starting with just 14 days. Give me two weeks and I will help you begin to take that anxiety, heartache, and anguish and turn it into peace, clarity, and hope as you move forward with your grief. Seriously, what do you have to lose by joining? Challenge your grief and give yourself some relief, my friend. I have no doubt this 14 days will be an inspiring, uplifting, perspective-changing experience for you. Join now through the link in the show description. So because of that, you know, for me, that was not the case at first and getting to where he and I are now took time and it took a lot of communication. And I will say, I mean, a lot of aspects of my grief and of course, just the deaths of my parents was very important in terms of why and how I formed losses become gains in this podcast in the first place. But his lack of understanding or empathizing with my pain But also my sort of like unfair or almost even high expectations ultimately led us to basically taking a break in our relationship. But it was it was a breakup. You guys, there was no sign of getting back together. Now, we are married with a daughter now, so clearly we did. (laughs) But it did take some very important and honest conversations to get there. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about these expectations that we might carry with us, especially through grief or in the grieving experience, whether it's a significant other or some other family or family member or friend that you are just not aligning with just to dig a little bit deeper and just to keep using this as an example, I'll just continue using John. So let me preface it by saying that he has been very lucky in that he has not experienced much loss at all. Like he will even say, I have not been through a traumatic experience, a traumatic loss. He's lost a family member or two when he was much younger, a couple of dogs that he wasn't particularly bonded with, but no person that was, that he was remotely like that close to nobody like a parent or a sibling or, you know, just this devastating loss that can bring you to your knees. And trust me, after seeing what I've been through, he knows how blessed he is. Okay. But point being, how can someone genuinely empathize or even remotely begin to understand someone's loss, especially that of a loved one, like a parent in my case, without having gone through that yourself? probably not super easily, right? So back in the early days of my grief, I'm realizing now hindsight's 2020 that I was like expecting him to, to almost like be on my level of grief and to be as, you know, out of sorts as I was, but now I'm kind of, and I don't, I don't shame myself for that now, by the way, like, again, you are in such a survival mode and, and your world is just crumbling around you. Okay, we're, we're in a little bit of panic. Okay, <laughs> like it's natural to kind of feel this way, um, especially when it's a person that is so near and dear to us. But now that I think about it, I'm like, why did I feel like I could hold him to an expectation of someone who had lost a really close loved one like that when he hadn't? Doesn't really, the, the math is not mathing <laughs> on that. Now, I was so blinded by grief And the whole world was just one big, fat, unfair place to be at the time for me. So there's that, right? Like I said, I'm giving myself grace for the things that I was thinking and feeling back then. And that is also a really normal part of grieving. Okay. So do not be ashamed of that. If, if you have fallen into this (laughs) trap before, but chances are we're going to act or think a touch irrationally. It just comes with the territory but we do need to check in with ourselves and we do sometimes need to ask ourselves 
these tough questions. And that's really hard to do when you are so blinded by grief. But, and I hate using the word mistake, but just bear with me because I don't really have a better word for it (laughs) right now because I don't feel like this was, it was not an intentional mistake that I did this, right? But my slip up here where, where I could have had the opportunity to be more empathetic was expecting people, i.e. my partner in this case, to understand my grief at the same level that I was at. I was expecting him and other people around me to meet me where I was. And in theory, that is a wonderful thought. And it is valid to ask that of someone like, hey, try try and meet me where I'm at. But if they don't, or if they can't, this is where a lot of disappointment can come to the forefront. For example, even if you are one of multiple siblings, your experience, like let's say you've both, you've lost a parent or it's just some loved one on kind of an even playing field for all of you, you're going to process that differently because no two grieving journeys are the same and each literally has their own fingerprint. It is as unique as we are. And realistically, I think in the back of my head, I knew that, but at the time, no one could match my grief as far as I was concerned, a little bit of an ego creeping in there, but that's how I felt. But at the same time, I I was kind of right there because I was the only, I am, was the only daughter of Greg and Lori Jordan. No one could match my grief in that way. So it's interesting to me now, even saying that out loud, that I was like sort of expecting people to be as devastated and like understanding me and my grief as I was. But how, when I'm the only child and no one can experience my grief like me? You know, I had a lot of conflicting and and complicated thoughts, you know, like no one, no one understands me and what I'm going through. I feel totally alone. I'm on my own. I'm on this just sinking life raft. (laughs) This, this royally sucks that, you know, just whole, oh, woe is me bit, which is so valid by the way. Okay. (laughs) But Another thought I had was, you know, why can no one relate to what I'm dealing with? This is a tragedy and no one seems to care. No one seems to get it. Does any of that sound remotely familiar? (laughs) Maybe you're feeling isolated. If so, I'm right there with you. And again, it's not that these things aren't a tragedy, but we do have to somehow come out of that and remember that it is unique to us. No one is going to experience it the way that we will. And our feelings around that are so valid. But looking back on it, before I had lost my parents and I was just blissfully living my life, (laughs) I for sure couldn't begin to grasp the loss of someone this close. It took me some time to realize that and to give other people grace for not understanding it too. Because how could they? If my grieving journey, my grieving experience is my own and we all feel things differently, why would I expect total and complete understanding of those around me? You know what I'm saying? It's kind of, I, I, th- I think it's just an important mindset to keep in mind. So if you're in the midst of this right now, again, I know how hard it is to kind of like come out of the, the fog of grief a little bit. But I, it's just things I want you to keep in mind because like I said, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. These are things that I kind of wish I had noticed or realized or had someone say to me back then because it would have, I don't know what it would have done for John and I's relationship or I don't know what it would have done for the relationships around me. But I do think it could have prevented a lot of frustration on my end. So Let's, let's talk about that really quick. Just dealing with frustrations of unmet expectations. The process of coping with unmet expectations can 1000% be very frustrating and very isolating. If you're struggling with finding some patience with this practice of trying to just get your expectations a little bit in check, or you honestly find it anxiety (laughs) inducing, I would love for you to listen to episode six, and that is four tips on where to start healing. This is a great place to start if you haven't listened to that episode yet, or you're newer to the podcast. Also episode 44 on understanding and coping with emotions as we grieve. And also even episode 58 about raising frequency and vibrational levels as we grieve, which could be a really, really empowering conversation 
for you to listen to. So I just threw out three there for you. These will all be linked in the show notes, but depending on where you are in your grieving experience, if this is like really new and very raw for you, or you're a little bit further along, I think there's really something for, for all of you here. Also, just to mention, my membership is a great place where we dig into this further with some really action-based coping tools. And I give you meditations and methods to de-stress and really process your grief on a monthly basis. Anyway, it's really great, you guys. Check that out in the show notes if you're interested. But I bring that up because it can be really hard to like bring ourselves back down to earth again <laughs> a little bit. Sometimes we need help or we need some guidance or some support or some tools to do that. And finding breath and finding some stillness and taking a moment to look at things very high level can be really critical and really pivotal and very, very important. It's seeing through those muddied waters of our loss and understanding that this all needs to be taken a step-by-step, a moment-by-moment at a time. So here are some things that I want to just share that I want you to just consider when you are figuring out your expectations with people, if you're reevaluating them, whatever this looks like for you. Before you inadvertently, or maybe even knowingly, not, not judging here, <laughs> jump down someone's throat or expect them to grieve the way that you are or just treat you in a certain way as you're grieving or be as hurt as you are or treat you a certain way, consider the following things. Number one, Consider what they have experienced in their life and think about if it's possible for them to be able to fairly relate to you. Really think about that a second. In my situation, for example, it was not really fair of me to expect John to know how to act with a girlfriend who just lost or was in the process of losing at this point two parents within six months when both of his are perfectly happy and healthy. There's just no way. He he didn't see what I saw. He didn't experience what I experienced. I'll be very honest. He never saw either of my parents truly in the thick of their illness because I never brought him around for that. Really out of respect for their privacy and just their own comfort. I didn't want to subject them to that. It was just, we were really dealing with it very like, really within the family. So he didn't experience the trauma of seeing my mom try and clean out her own tracheotomy tube. He didn't see my dad and I in the hospital room with her getting trained on how to do that for her. He didn't see my dad lying in bed, not being able to basically form a sentence properly because his cancer had spread to his brain without me knowing. Like there are just some really gritty raw stuff that is is very traumatizing and many parts honestly were worse than that i will spare you but the point being if he was spared from all of those horrific things that would cause me to feel my hurt so deeply and also just being my parents and, and watching them basically you know die in front of me then who am i to judge his reaction he was doing the best he could at the time I was doing the best I could at the time. And that's why, again, you guys, I just say with with these expectations that we have of people, we have to give other people grace, but we also have to give ourselves grace too. And that brings me to my next point. Consider that they have or had a different relationship with the loss or the loved one, if that is the case for you, than you did. It wasn't exactly fair of me to expect John to be as torn up about my parents as I was. Not that he didn't love them. In fact, he loved them very much. He's said that many times. He will still say to this day, you know, I'm, I miss them too. I mourn them too. And while he loved them, of course he didn't know them nearly on the level I did. I mean, come on, like they created me, right? They were my parents and I had a right to be upset. <laughs> but where things went kind of sideways is I took it out on him. But the thing is, it wasn't his fault that they were gone. It wasn't his fault that they were dying. But I, I treated my relationship as a punching bag. It's kind of the best way I can put it. And again, 
it's I I think back and I I do have patience for myself in that time. I don't look back on those times and and shame myself because like I said, I had never been through something like this. I was in such a state of like fight, flight, freeze, survival that I I didn't have the the best or the healthiest coping tools or or coping mechanisms. I didn't know what I didn't know. But now I do, and this is why I love to help people like you if you need it and just things to keep in mind. All right. So this leads me to my next point. Consider how someone might process a loss. Some people are more outwardly emotional. Some people process their emotion more internally. And there's about a million levels of that in between. Just to keep using John as my example here, he is not a particularly emotional guy. I would consider myself maybe like average on the scale as far as maybe even like a little bit below average, to be honest, as far as like being really emotional about things. But I can think of members of my husband's family, for example, or even some friends around me that are far more emotional than I am or than he is. So think about that. If there is a disconnect between how you and another person in your circle right now process emotions and process grief, remember we talked about nature versus nurture earlier, that could lead to unmet expectations. Maybe they're not comfortable with being so in it with you. And that's really sad. I know that. But in fact, I was just talking to a client the other day and they were sharing with me that, you know, there are people within their circle right now that have just absolutely crumbled. But meanwhile, this beautiful client of mine is like, I, they're going through some anticipatory grief right now. And they're like, I there was no option for me not to be strong for my loved one that wouldn't even cross my mind. Right. But just goes to show that not everyone around you might have the strength to do that. And grief does that to people and that's okay. We need to, we need to give grace on both sides of the spectrum, but you know, you might be going through this awful situation and not understand how, Maybe it makes them emotional or you might not understand, like, how are you not showing up better right now? These are fair questions to ask. It's not, I never want anyone here to feel guilty for wondering these things, whether to yourself or aloud, but it's the nature of this beast that that is grief. And another good example of this is maybe how they are literally responding to you as you are sharing how you feel. So maybe you're just often hearing like, yeah, I, I hear you. That, that must be, that must be difficult or, uh-huh. Yeah. That, that must be really hard, babe. Can you, can you tell I've been through this a few times, right? Those were things that I, I heard my then boyfriend now husband say to me, like, cause he didn't know what to say. And he even admitted that in episode nine, he was like, I didn't know what to say to you. I didn't really know how to support you. I'd never been through this. There, there are ways to show up for people though. And he's learned that since then. And that is just the role of a good supporter. You, you do need to maybe do a little research or, or reach out for help on your own behalf to better be able to show up for the person that's really going through the thick of it. And let's be honest. Some people are just more deeply empathetic. I'm looking at you, especially empaths, (laughs) if you're listening, or they're just better at putting themselves in others' shoes than others are. And I personally, and especially as a coach, I find that to be one of my strengths. I do feel I am very empathetic. I am very good at putting myself in other people's situations or being able to kind of like take that on and, and just hold that space. But I know plenty of people out there that that doesn't come naturally and that's okay. We can't, we can't shame people for that. Sure, we could feel like they could try a little bit harder, right? It's all about compromise. But here's the kicker. You could come across someone who has gone through the exact same tragedy as you. I I know people in my own life that have lost a parent or two. And they still might not live up to your expectation of understanding you or what you've been through. But it's interesting because you would think they could, right? Like it's like, you, you know what it is to lose a mom. You know what it is to lose a dad. And here they are disappointing us. 
And because of all of the reasons I have mentioned so far, I'm going to say it one more time. You can't expect yourself from other people. Just because you sent your best friend flowers when they were going through something difficult or something even wonderful, right? Whatever the the occasion was, doesn't mean that you can or even should expect that from them. I have seen friends in my life expect certain things of other friends, like in our friend group, and it got really misaligned and their relationship has, has changed, has suffered because of that. And there just was like a lack of communication about it. And it's such a bummer to see things like that kind of unfold in front of you. Another example, you know, just because you set up a meal train for someone so they wouldn't have to worry about cooking for a week doesn't mean you can or should expect that too. It's lovely too. Of course we can hope. (laughs) And I hate to sound so cynical here because I am not normally like this. If you know me, if you've listened to this podcast before, you know, I'm a pretty, pretty positive and pretty upbeat person. But it's, it's just especially when it comes to coping with unmet expectations in the grief experience, especially this does show up differently. And that being said, they might show up for you in ways that you didn't expect. So, you know, there could be some positives here too. (laughs) Like I said, it's not all doom and gloom, but the thing with grief, like I was saying earlier, it can make people uncomfortable. Not everyone knows how to navigate it or what specifically will help you. And what might be helpful for one person might not be helpful for another. So it's all just important things to keep in mind here. And also I wanna just point out love languages, right? Love languages show up very differently in each person. And by the way, if you've never heard of the five love languages or you just need a refresher, just give it a quick Google. There's actually a book on it too called The Five Love Languages, The Secret to Love That Lasts by Gary Chapman. I would highly recommend it. John and I actually used this book when we got back together and it sparked some amazing conversations and we learned a lot about each other and what we needed for a healthy relationship. And it is just so helpful with setting expectations and understanding how someone does or doesn't resonate with the way that you give and receive love. Now, this goes for friendships too. This goes for colleagues. This goes for other people in our life outside of romantic relationships. For example, one of my best friends is a gift giving, card writing queen, and I love her to death for it. It's one of my favorite things about her. She's very, very thoughtful. But truthfully, that has never been my thing. I am more of a quality time, checking in on them, being that shoulder to lean on, acts of service with a little side of physical touch. I love cuddles. I love hugs. <laughs> and, you know, I just can't stress this enough, especially if you're in a relationship and suffering a loss of some kind, take that time to learn about each other's love language. Or even if you don't have such a, an in-depth conversation about this, maybe just take note or think about like in what ways that they have shown love in the past or received love in the past and see if it might differ from yours a little bit. It could be very eye-opening. And ask yourself these questions, you know, what do I need to feel supported through grief? Is it alone time? Is it extra cuddles? Is it a distraction like going on a walk or binging a show? Figuring out how to show up for each other. So another big, big thing here as we start to wrap up this episode is communication. We have to communicate. Now, is it completely your job to be the one to communicate your wants and needs during the grieving process? No, absolutely not. I I would argue no, at least. You've got a lot going on and perhaps communicating anything at all is a chore right now, let alone communicating that well. Maybe you just do not know what you want. You don't know how to say it. You don't know how to ask for it. I want to honor that because I can, I can put myself back in those early days of my grief. And, and that was me. And I also came from, especially my dad, like who did not like being an imposition on people. I still struggle with this. I don't like asking people for things. It just makes me feel uncomfy. I don't know. I, I don't like putting people out. So that was hard and I needed to navigate that. I really had to give myself permission to let people help me. So it's really just remembering it takes two people to create a successful friendship or relationship. And that need for being there for each other or one person leaning in to lift the other person up, that can ebb and flow throughout your life. 
But from where I am sitting now and having gone through all of this, I would say it, it should be a healthy mix of good quality people checking in on you and supporting you and you. And I know this can feel like a huge ask, but hear me out really quickly on this next part. Your loved ones are not mind readers, most likely. <laughs> I hate to break it to you, but unless a loved one of yours is an actual mind reader, your loved ones are not mind readers. I learned this the hard way. It, it's actually kind of comical what I expected looking back on it. Again, I don't shame myself for this. I don't, I don't like get on myself about it, but looking back, I was like, man, I really expected John, especially for example, to like read my mind half the time. And he even joked about that. We, we laughed about it in our episode together in a loving way, of course. But again, just to like use him as an example, there were ways where he could have been more understanding, more proactive and asked how I could be supported in those days. You know, he came from a place where it's like, I just didn't want to bother you. I didn't want to add more to your plate. So it's just finding that balance of communicating what we need and want and doing that confidently and the other person showing up and not just in the moment, but this is like big picture stuff, right? For me, taking the time to realize my grief was not going to go away overnight, that it would come and go in waves. Real quick interruption here, and then we'll get back to this episode. If you are someone who is experiencing some form of loss and are trying to navigate the complexities of grief, which you likely are in some capacity if you've stumbled upon this podcast, then this message is for you. If you haven't heard about my Life with Grief membership and community yet, this is truly something you need to check out. This membership is here to guide you into living a deeper, more meaningful, and full life after experiencing loss. Who doesn't want that, right? I created this membership because I know what it's like to navigate and cope with grief on a daily basis, and I know the tools and support it takes to do this effectively. I've done the work myself, and I've coached people just like you to do the same. It comes down to having impactful, effective resources and tools at your disposal, having the right support around you from people who can understand and empathize with your grief, and having encouragement and inspiration around you consistently to not only elicit and spark change, but to keep it and keep the positive momentum going. Enrollment opens once a month for a limited time. Check out the details linked in the description, and I hope to see you in there. It's going to continue to come up and I'm going to continue to navigate it in various aspects of my life with our wedding, with the birth of our daughter. I mean, all of these things and these waves, they're going to knock us on our butts some days and I have to be prepared for that. And he, as my partner has to be prepared for that. And he, he had to be prepared for that back in those days, but we didn't, we didn't know how to do that at the time. He truly couldn't comprehend what I was feeling. I didn't know how to process it or communicate what I needed because it was all a first for me too. It was chaos, you guys, and you might be able to empathize with this. So I just want to normalize that also. <laughs> and just also taking into account a million other things that could be going on for you right now. Maybe you're dealing with someone's estate. Maybe you have kids to take care of. Like for me, I had a geriatric dog that I also was taking care of during all of this. I had a full-time job that I had to keep working and all of this compounded and led to a breakup on the same day that I had to call 911 for my dad for the second time because he was like almost unresponsive. Like you can't make this stuff up. This is the reality of grief. It's, it's messy. It's very, very complicated. There has to be a lot of grace given on all sides. So really quick to close out this episode, I'd mentioned towards the beginning of this episode that I was going to just touch on this let them theory. And I thought this was really, really important just to, to scratch the surface and mention today. So for those of you who may or may not be familiar with Mel Robbins, this is where I first heard of it. I don't know that she created this. Don't quote me on that. But she, for example, here's, here's just some examples for you. Um, this is her quote. If your friends are not inviting you out to brunch this weekend, let them. If the person that you're really attracted to is not interested in a commitment, let them. If your kids don't want to get up and go to that thing with you this weekend, let them. As she sees it, 
too much time and energy is wasted on forcing other people to match our expectations. So just letting them, quote unquote, (laughs) is a better response, especially in our romantic lives and especially as friendships go. I want to preface the rest of what I'm going to say here. You know, this, I think we need to take this conversation a little bit out of the grieving process because that is very nuanced, right? That is a place where people should and hopefully are showing up for you in a bigger way than they normally might. So with this next part of this conversation, I just want to just want to give that context, right? You can think about this just in other aspects of your life, perhaps nothing to do with grief. Maybe this is just friends or people around you that are kind of just not meeting your expectations or just kind of letting you down. Or maybe you're just feeling a lot of, of thoughts and ruminating thoughts on people just letting you down lately. So she goes on to say, the truth is if somebody is not showing up how you need them to show up, don't try to force them to change. And I I do actually feel this is relevant to the grieving process for sure, from all the reasons we talked about today, right? We are products of how we were born, how we were raised, just so many environmental factors. Let them be themselves because they are revealing who they are to you. So, So let them, let them do that. The beauty of this is you get to choose what to do next. And it seems like a simple enough idea, right? When you let your concerns about how others feel about you or whatever the situation is fall to the wayside, you'll experience a lot more control and calm in your life. It's a little bit of like case sera sera meets, you know, meet them where they're at <laughs> sort of. But on the flip side, it may not be that easy to put all of this into practice in your life. And I want to, I want to acknowledge that. So I did just a little more research on this. And according to a couple of different therapists, it sounds like this, this let them motto can be really game changing for many people, but they do have some caveats. And I thought this was really important to, to point this out. So psychotherapist Sadaf Siddiqui, I really hope I didn't totally botch that. (laughs) He practices in New York and he said, As a psychotherapist, I think this approach could be useful to people who tend to internalize other people's behavior, struggle to allow others to have autonomy, or engage in anxious attachment patterns. Others may not find it as constructive, including people pleasers, since they are more prone to letting people supersede their needs and wants. People pleasers generally allow others to do as they wish without any consideration of how their behaviors might impact others. So this let them approach might prevent them from speaking up or being heard, which is not what you want, right? You do want to make your needs and wants known to make sure that they are getting met. Another therapist, Jennifer Chapel Marsh, who is based in San Diego, mentions that she generally likes this let them theory as well, but she had mentioned in this article I was reading that it reminds her of a personality psychology concept that she emphasizes with her clients called the locus of control. So this was actually a theory developed by an American psychologist, Julian B. Rotter in 1954. And the locus of control is the degree to which people believe that they, as opposed to outside forces, have control over the outcome of events in their life. And as a concept, it plays kind of nicely with this let them theory when you, you know, let your friends go to brunch without you and then consciously choose to do something fun by yourself or with another group of friends. You know, and that and that action on your part is essential to this. And you're seizing back some of that control and just refusing to let external forces ultimately ruin your day, right? And as we're grieving, this is especially important because Our day can already feel like it's ruined before it even starts, right? (laughs) So what she says here, I'm just going to quote her real quick. She says, it's about understanding where our influence ends and accepting that some things are beyond our control. We can't control others. So instead we should shift focus on our own actions and responses. Context really matters too, though. And yes, it's important to let your partner, for example, have autonomy over making their own decisions, pursue their goals and decide what they want to do with their time and what they want to do with their life. 
but it's sometimes just as important that you express how their behavior impacts you. And this is especially true if it's something that violates your boundaries and you know, you can let them be who they are, but especially in intimate relationships, connection is formed through vulnerability and open communication. And so this is, this is pretty pivotal in platonic relationships. The approach to let your friends exist as they are can really help increase tolerance and acceptance of people who may have different opinions, perspectives, and interests as you. So remember what I was saying a little bit earlier about my friends that just have different levels of expectations within their friendships and how engaged they are. Perfect example of that. So I think it's just important to keep in mind, you know, of course, this let them theory is not a one size fits all solution (laughs) for any interpersonal problems that we're having. This idea for sure should not be applied in harmful situations where your safety or someone else's safety is at risk. A mental health crisis or a substance abuse issue that needs to be addressed, anything more serious like that, again, please seek the appropriate help for that. But it's also important to not confuse acceptance with indifference. And this let them approach with empathy and with active involvement in relationships is very, very critical. And just to quote Jennifer Chapel Marsh one more time, she also cautions against using this let them theory as an excuse to avoid confrontations. So like I was saying earlier, right? Like, do we have a difficult conversation or that uncomfortable conversation with someone or do we not? And so what she says here is sometimes difficult conversations are necessary for resolving issues and avoiding them can lead to more problems in relationships. And also just in my own experience, I've noticed it can also lead to some resentment. So we have to be really careful as an overall approach, though, it seemed to me that these therapists and psychotherapists overall thought the theory could help people feel more empowered and have more agency in their life. And one of them said, I like that. Let them promotes a stance of non-judgmental acceptance, especially in situations we cannot fully control, which if you think about it is most situations. And I just thought that was a great place to leave it because whether it is grief, whether it is a completely non grief related situation, there is a lot of things that are out of our control in our life, right? We cannot control other people. We can't control how they react to something. At the end of the day, all we can do is control our thoughts and our actions. So this is just something I want you to consider as I leave you here today, but this let them theory just really spoke to me. And I just thought it was very timely and prevalent (laughs) to put into this episode. But listen, my friend, if you have made it this far, do yourself a favor and check in with yourself, allow yourself to sit or lay eyes closed in some quiet. If you can sit in your car, a salt bath, nature, whatever, and ask yourself how you are like how you really are. Ask yourself what you need. What would spark joy for you right now? How you need and want to feel supported. And what do you humbly ask of those around you? Do that and say that. And the truth is they might not know exactly what to say or do. So you have to find it within yourself to either tell them or be honest with their feelings The truth is they might not know exactly what to say or do, and that's okay. And you might not know what to say or do, and that's also okay. All you have to do is find it within yourself to tell them if you feel you really need to say something and just be honest with your feelings. Be honest about how your loss is affecting you. Be honest about what kind of support you need. Don't keep the ones who love you in the dark and deal with your expectations and your grief head on. And if you do this, listen, I can't guarantee it's going to be an easy road. I never try and make any promises or guarantees here, but the more in check we are with this and the more realistic we are with our expectations, I assure you, you will have a far more peaceful and pleasant coping process. 
All right, my friend, that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for hanging out with me through this episode. A lot of really, really important stuff here. I really hope you felt maybe some mindset shifts or just some things come up for you throughout this episode. If you liked what you heard today, I would so appreciate a rating or a review wherever you're listening or sharing this episode or any other episode here on the podcast with a friend or a family member who might need it. I know there are so many of us going through this grieving experience. We all need a little more support and help each and every day. And as always, that is my goal here. So however many people I can reach, that's what I want to do. So I appreciate you so much. I am sending you all of the light and love as always, and I'll see you in the next episode. I am sending you a huge thank you for tuning into today's episode, my friend. I'm so grateful you're here and for the steps you are taking to heal your heart, open your mind, fulfill your soul, learn, grow, and evolve, and move through this crazy thing called life in big, beautiful, impactful ways. Visit LossesBecomeGains.com for my blog, ways to work with me, to shop my daily journal, and so much more. And be sure you're following along on Instagram and Facebook at Life with Grief Podcast. I love seeing new faces, meeting new people, hearing your stories, and supporting you however I can. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. If you haven't left a rating or review, please do so. I would so appreciate it. Or if you feel so inclined to share this episode or this podcast with someone who could use it too. I'll catch you in the next episode.